as been told, I've been ordnance server for 10 years, got a background in cartography for eight years before that. Um, I was using SME for, well, about six years now. I started off using the interoperability extension in Esri, but soon realized that it didn't have enough in there, and so we got SME in and got the full suite in. Um, so for the last year and a half, I've been a senior product developer um, in a team where we do lots of prototyping. Um, <coughs> in my spare time, I love playing sport, so there's me in a civil service beach volleyball competition with my old manager on his knees in front of me and my new, ma <laughs> and my new manager looking on. <laughs> um, also like playing rugby, which I'm not sure how much rugby's played in Canada. But um, my first game for this team, they managed to give me, as it was my first match, they gave me the tightest shirt they could ever imagine. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, that took a while to get off. <clears throat> so, who is Ordnance Survey? I assume a lot of people in here know who Ordnance Survey is. We're the National Mapping Authority of Great Britain, so we're in charge of the um, main database that we've got. Um, it's held in Oracle database, it's got over 450 million features in there, um, and we've got over 600 surveyors going out, capturing changes every day, so there's over 5,000 changes being updated on there. Um, we are well known for our um, paper maps, so we've got um, 25 tail scale and 50 tail scale um, ranges of maps all to um, cover the whole country. But now we are starting to do a lot more in data as well. So product development. In our team, um, we get asked to do lots of different things. We, um, some of the things we get asked to are just little problem fixes or bug fixes to certain products or certain processes. But mainly we've got these um, three different um, stages of our prototyping. So you've got the illustrative, which is um, a prototype to illustrate ideas to others within the business or to a customer. You've got the alpha prototype, which is a draft version of a product, and a beta prototype, which is a productionized prototype as close to a final product as possible. So both the alpha and the beta products um, being iterative processes, so we can um, output one type of product, and then we can go to customers with it, they get some feedback, go back, and then we can update <coughs> it, make it better, send it back out to customers for more feedback. <coughs> so, first of our projects um, is a contour value placement. So, <coughs> quick brief, um, what we've got is, we've got a load of contours um, in one of our uh, maps for the 10th hour, and at the moment, the cartographers are being put in um, the contour labels in contour ladders that go up and down. And they make sure that they're in the ladders and they're not clashing with other features and things like that. So this project was to try and take those um, contour labels, which are point features in the Tensor database, and see if we can get them to snap onto our new IDTM contour shapefiles. So for a new digital product. So this one sits in the problem solving part of product development. <coughs> so first thing we tried was just using the IDTM contours, loading them into ArcGIS, and then you try and use the Matplex label engine to try and put labels onto the contours and make ladders with them. Um, as you can see, it didn't really work that well. You can kind of see here, you've got a ladder, but that's about it. Whereas, <coughs> In one of our products, which is where we've got um, the cartographers, we've actually put the ladders in the product there to make sure it doesn't clash with any of the features. So, onto the workbench. Um, it's quite a simple workbench, really. Um, <coughs> so the contour labels come from the existing 10 scale, scale product where cartographers have already placed the labels. So the first thing we do is filter out any labels that have a zero rotation and more than 30 meters <coughs> from the nearest contour. So we've got our contours, and then we've got the points. So first of all, we add a point to the contour line using the closest candidate using neighbor finder.
then we <coughs> um, pick out the closest contour, stick that point on the line, and then using a 2D point adder to create a line 30 meters long. Then we rotate the line using the orientation value from the, um, for the contour label. And we apply a bounding box to this line and then buffer it by three meters to make sure you clip out a line that is close to a horizontal line. So if this red line here is a horizontal line, then sometimes using um, just applying a bounding box, you might have the bounding box far too thin to actually use the clipper onto it. So that's why we buffer it. And then we clip out the contour. And then we kind of snap the start line that, of the line we created, the red one, to the contour segment using anchored snapper with the contour being anchored. So we make sure we don't move the contours. We find the closest point on the line to the contour segment, which will now be the point we just snapped it to. Extract the first cohorts of the segment and using the closest candidate cohorts from another neighbor finder or from the line, we can test to see if they're the same. If they're not the same, then we can flip the direction of the contour segment so when we label it, it will read the correct way up. So then we've got the labels all on the contours all in the right way. And then as a final product, we can now got all the contours in ladders, making sure that they're in the right places that the cartographers have put them in the first place. Next project is an illustrative Gazapier product. Clicker seems to be a lot slower than I thought. Yeah. <coughs> so illustrative gazetteer. Um, we've got we had a, a few products um, in OS at the moment, and um, we've got the ga 50k gazetteer and a product called OS Locator, which um, this um, illustrative prototype was supposed to do um, take these two products and kind of merge them into one. So then we have a gazetteer with place names and with um, road names as well. So using our OS master map integrated transport network or ITM layer, um, which is this one. Um, this is the ITM layer overlaid onto typo and imagery. Um, we used boundary line, which is one of our other products. And we've got an in-house settlements names database, which we've put together to make sure we've got a definitive name for each settlement. And this one obviously sits in the illustrative part of the product development flow line. So, very, well, it looks like a complicated workbench. First of all, we come to this one. Um, so here, um, we, <coughs> um, FME was good for overlaying and testing of data and attributes. So using a point on area overlay, we can test the notional centers of settlements um, to see which other areas, if any, they are in, suburban areas inside towns, cities, for example. So each of these settlements in our settlements database also have a point. That point can then be overlaid on all the rest of the areas to see how many um, areas that point falls into. And then going on to the roads. Um, um, in our ITN layer, we have a layer called network link, which is just every single link um, to the whole country. But then all of those have got attributes on, and we've also got a road polygon layer, and that will be the bounding box of the entire um, road. So if you've got um, the M27, which goes um, out of Southampton, then the polygon will have the whole bounding box of that, which will go from Southampton all the way to London, whereas the ITN links will um, be just the, all the different segments where the, another road intersects it. So here, I was um, making sure that I could um, aggregate all the links together into one, and then using the road polygon, I could create a point inside that, and then find the middle of the road using that point using the neighbor finder. <coughs> and the neighbor finder finding the nearest matching road link to the point generated from the polygon. So 
So this is a sample bit of data that came out of the Gazetteer. <coughs> um, obviously, it's a bit smaller than this one. Um, but over here, you've got place names, and then you've got a within attribute. So you might have um, a city within a, or a town within a city. Um, and then you've got the roads as well. So you've got the road name, and then you'll have whether the roads within the city or within the town or what that lot. And then over here, it will tell you all the boundaries that it's within as well. And we've also got it in British National Grid coordinates and ETRS 89 coordinates as well. And then you can take this data and you can put it into a um, Gazetteer um, prototype web front end. So you can use this data um, in the background. Um, and in the web front end, you can just type in the name of a settlement or a road and then it will pinpoint that road using the um, coordinates and you can see where it is. So from this, um, they're now um, working on a, an alpha version of the Gazetteer um, called the Gazetteer of Great Britain. So as you can see, we've <coughs> um, added my unique IDs, road names and numbers, settlements by hierarchy and postcodes. But I think as the um, alpha turns into a beta, then things like hills and mountains, forests and lakes will be added as well. So it'll be quite a, a good product for people to use. Yep. How do you handle the very rural part between the settlements? Um, in our settlements database, we've actually got a near to polygon as well. So say you've got um, Southampton, and then you've got a little like town outside called Romsey, and then in between that, there's a, there's, there's a space between that and Winchester. So the space in between will um, either be a polygon, it'll be either near to Southampton, and there'll be a, um, a, kind of a split, and then there'll be a, one above it saying near to Winchester. So then if a road um, point actually falls in that area, then instead of being within a certain settlement, it'll say near to that settlement. <coughs> So, on to the next one. We've got the illustrative 3D PDF. Um, this one was to create a, um, a 3D PDF um, using DGN file from a customer in Bahrain, which is SLRB in Bahrain. Um, they sent us this DGN file of um, one of their main areas in Bahrain. Um, this was a... Um, um, a, a, a task in showing them what we could do with their data and because they wanted to, us to make a 3D um, data model and a prototype database. So this one falls in the illustrative again in product development. So going on to the workbench, um, what I had to do because um, of the DGN file and um, being a CAD system, um, a lot of the geometries in the CAD system um, didn't match up properly. So when I was passing it through SME, I found a lot of errors. And I couldn't um, get it to output the PDF properly without on two faces being overlapped onto each other and they start flickering. So using SME, I managed to um, sort out where all the geometry errors were. I read to that to a shape file, put it in ArcGIS, and then started to fix them. So you, so you can see here the bottom polygon is highlighted. There's no errors in that polygon at the moment, you can see. And when you highlight the top polygon, and you can see that you've got a nice little spike coming out here. And that spike there will create two faces. You'll have a face from the top polygon along here, and you'll have a face from the bottom polygon along here. So those are the type of errors I need to go through and manually fix. And then when you fix them, obviously you just put the spikes back up and then you've got your two polygons and you won't have your flickering faces. So once all those are fixed, the shape files are then um, read back into SME with the same one, just by disabling certain readers and writers. And then using PDF stylers, um, I was able to style the PDF. Um, if I just So 
see that. It's quite hard trying to maneuver something behind you. with a trackpad as well. But yeah, you can see there, fully 3D model of Bahrain, <coughs> straight from their DGN file through the PDF, um, 3D PDF writer. And we did find with a 3D PDF writer, if you stick too much data in there, then it, the 3D PDF just crashes and it's not, not very responsive whatsoever. So I would suggest if you are going to use a 3D, 3D PDF, then make sure your data is quite small or you're using a small area. question. Um, it wasn't that long, it was probably about 20 minutes. Like that. So, now coming on to one of the um, more latest products that we've put out, the OS Master Map <coughs> Color Filler Building Height Attribute. Um, someone needs to come up with a better name for that, it's a bit long. But anyway, um, what happened is we have, um, we've got a topo layer, which <coughs> is just a 2D representation of Great Britain um, at a very detailed scale with lots of, well, lots of attribution. And product manager wanted to get um, building height attribution as well to go along with that. So then people can actually start using the topo and start extruding it up to the proper height of the building to try and get a, a very simple 3D model from it. Um, so I was asked to transform raw data from our remote sensing department who use photogrammetry and um, other bits and bobs to produce the um, building height data. And then I was asked to also build a fulfillment system so we could actually pump this data out to our customers as they ordered it. Um, this one in an alpha, just there. So, first of all, we take the DTM that we hold in store. We then um, create the DSM from remote sensing using our imagery. And then along with the topography layer, um, we put all these three things into socket sets and they generate all the values of the building. So hopefully we can create something like that. So first thing I had to do was take um, all the data that they created, which was sat in Excel files. Um, and there was thousands of these Excel files all sat in different folders. Um, so what I did, I used the directory and path file name reader, I think it is, um, to read in all the Excel files and also set the file properties as well so I could then read in the modified date of the file because they needed that modified date in, in the attribute so then customers know when it was captured. <coughs> so um, this was passed into a workspace runner and this workspace runner ran this workbench. Um, this workbench took each Excel file um, individually, um, passed it through, performed some calculations on the data, because um, we realized that some of the calculations and some of the attributes that were coming from socket set were not um, great. So we um, did some simple um, um, updates to it. And then each Excel file was loaded into an Oracle database um, one at a time. And because it's a tile-based, um, we work on a tile-based system, each Excel file was part of the tile. So after this one, we just I just ran a simple duplicate remover routine. Any data that falls along the edge, um, I used our unique ID, which is called a toid, so a topographic identifier. And anything with a duplicate toid got removed. Thank you. 
So this is um, sample data. This is um, come out as a CSV file. So a little diagram here to explain what all the um, attributes are. So obviously you've got the abs h min, which is the lowest part of the building. The abs h2, which is the top of the main building without the roof. The abs h max, which is the top of the entire building. And then you've got the relative h2, which is the height between h min and h2. And the relative h max, which is the height between the h max and the h min. So if people wanted to use this product, then they could choose whichever value they wanted to extrude by. So if they wanted to extrude without roofs, so they, then it's quite simple. So then onto the um, fulfillment system. Um, so I had to build a fulfillment system that cut out the data based on a given polygon that was fed into it. So that could polygon could either be um, a national um, polygon, so it could be the GB polygon, England polygon, Scotland polygon, whatever. Or it could be a specific um, 100K tile. Um, in Britain, we've got um, the British National Grid coordinate system, which splits it up into tiles. Um, or we've got a, um, a, a database called the Contract Polygon Store, where when our customers um, log on to our website, they can actually draw their own polygon, and then that polygon is stored in this database. Um, but this um, and each polygon is given a specific contract ID. So when people were, could enter the contract ID, then it will pull out the contract ID um, from the, the store, pull out the polygon, put it in FME. This, pol this workbench then tests for if that polygon is um, bigger than the GB polygon. Uh, if the GB polygon is totally in, inside this polygon, then um, the workbench just writes out a simple text file to, just to say, um, supply the GB polygon. <coughs> if it's smaller, then it gets run into a feature reader. And then the, um, the feature reader then um, connects to my Oracle database or the building height attribute and data into it, in it. And then it will only pull out the data that's actually intersects with that polygon. And then that will be written out to a CSV file. Um, what I've also done in this is um, it will test for invalid entries. So if the contract ID does not exist or whether there is no data available for the chosen area, and it will create a text file to inform the user of those. That way, if one of my <laughs> colleagues in the digital supply <coughs> team um, mistype a contract ID and they get a number wrong, then it won't just start using a different polygon or something like that. They can, they can actually know whether they got it wrong or not. Um, I'm actually in the process now of trying to get this one onto FME server, but um, the firewalls at work are, are causing problems. So we gave this um, building height attribute to one of my colleagues in the Carto design team, um, Chris Wesson, who has created these for me. So the top one there is um, the building height attribute on, um, on top of our topography layer, which is draped over another one of our products called Terrain 5. Um, and the top one also has our new water layer products as well. And the bottom one is just the same, but different angle, but without the water layer. So you can kind of see the kind of things we can do with it now to create 3D models. Coming on to this one, this was one of my first projects when I worked into the, came into the product development team. Um, <coughs> so this is a product that shows the extent of certain areas like schools, hospitals, airports, train stations, etc. Um, this type of product can be utilised well by organisations like emergency services, making it easier to find access points for these areas. Because um, what happens is these functional sites are so in our topography layer, we'll have the building, and the building will have an attribute called hospital. But what we've gone and done is we've actually found out the whole extent of the hospital, including any little buildings or areas, paths, any in, like in, um, internal roads. And then we've put that polygon on the outside, and that's called a functional site. We've also got another um, data set called access points. And these ones are all the access points into that functional site. 
So it's any access point by a road, by a path, anything like that. That way, um, um, if emergency services or anything like that need to find that access or to that site, they can know that there's no point going round to the left, there's an access point, you might as well go round the right and use the road. So this one sits in the beta. Um, this product was um, designed to um, be as close to a production system as possible. Again, quite a big workbench. Um, I'll just go into it. So the first bit here was um, filtering out certain features that were not going to the product. So um, the only things we wanted were things like airports or schools or hospitals or anything to do with utilities and stuff like that. So there's a, just a load of testers there testing for certain um, names and the attributes. And then here we filter out access points that are too far away and we create routing points on roads and road nodes. So the neighbour finder will find the nearest road link to the access point, place a point on the road, and then if the point is five metres or less away from the road node, it will snap the node, snap the point to the node using the anchor snappers. We can overlay our ITN layer onto it. And then the blue dots there are where we have created routing points. And if any of the access points were within that five meters of any of those white road nodes, then a blue dot will not get created because all the information will be then put onto the road node. So with this, we had to output into four different um, formats. We had to do shape, GML, map info, and tab, um, map info and database. So we use MapInfo stylers to um, style all the MapInfo tab type files. And then just this part of the workbench was just to create the GML. Um, I've actually just been in the other, I think it was track four, where they've just created, um, in 2014, they've come out with a GML schema writer. So hopefully in the future this kind of thing won't happen. Um, <coughs> so along the top, will be just writing out the functional sites. In the middle bit will be um, access points. And then the bottom bit will be routing points. And then anywhere where you see a bit like this is where I've had to use um, testers um, for optional attributes. So with the XML templator, it's very hard to use optional, uh, optional attributes. So just to and show what the product actually looks like. This is um, the sites layer overlaid onto OS master map topo layer. So the functional sites in purple and the access points and routing points as you've just shown there. And then we can overlay it also onto another form of our product which is the vector map district. So you can see the range of um, functional sites that we've got. So it's very um, good for emergency services and other, other people that need to know this type of data or type of information. <coughs> and it's only really. So in summary, um, in our product development team, we have a vast array of projects coming in um, all the time. Um, that for me is vital to many of them. And for some of these projects, including the last one, Without FME, we would not have got the um, project done on time. Um, and yeah. <laughs> Any questions? So thanks, Bez. Does anybody have any questions? I'd like to go back and see how you did those um, coordinate, uh, the contour numbers on the edges of the contours. How did you end up with just one number on every contour? So you must have picked a point somewhere along the line there. And um, well, the contours, they, um, we had a file. So each contour value was a point from a geodatabase with, a, with, a, with, the, with the, the value on it. 
So that was already placed by the cartographers. Ah. So um, that we just use those points and then snap them onto the IDTM lines, mm -hmm. and then um, to get them the right way around, and um, through using SME yeah. to make sure the ladder's read right. Yeah, because usually you see them with a whole lot of names around uh, names around them, which yeah. is less than useful. Sure. Um, all, you know, in the Tanto series, um, the whole series is everything has been done by the cartographers. So all the points are placed, everything's um, properly placed. There's a little bit of generalization done um, automatically. But yeah. Yeah. So the cartographers will pick which way, which where all the ladders will go, and then we use those points. And then we can use our new contour shape files and stuff, and we can then place the points on the contours in the right places so they'll actually work with our products better. So then we can actually start um, pumping out a lot of vector products because at the moment a lot of the things are raster. Yeah, I suppose we could do that, but then it'll take the cartographers then off their job at the, at the time as well. Cause although we do have about 60 cartographers at OS, and they're all very, very busy on um, the production schedules because we do um, rack products that cover the whole country, then there's a, there's a very tight schedule for actually updating all the rack products as well. PDF? I think it's the other way around. I think, I think the 3D so. PDF. It's on 32. It's, but it's on, a, on 64. It might be on 32, yeah. Um, do, you, do you know? I, I, I don't know off the top of my head. Oh, it would be good if it wasn't 64. But. Oh, no, no, 32. Yeah, they're only 32. Yeah, so no, at this point, no. Which is why I asked why, how long it took, because it seems to me anything I've ever tried to write to 3D PDF has been notoriously slow. Mm. So you're getting pretty good throughput for it then? No, I don't know, that was the first time I tried it. So. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> fair enough, good.